Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. I'm Marty Switzer, CEO of Contango Asset Management. I'm also a director of Can Contango Income Generator. WCM Investment Management, for those who don't know, but we realize there are a lot of shareholders that, that, that are aware of WCM. WCM are a, a top quartile global equities manager from Laguna Beach, California. They manage $85 billion. They've got an outstanding investment track record across multiple strategies. The large cap strategy has averaged around 15 percent per annum since 2008. The small cap strategy has averaged about 23.4 percent since 2014. And this proposed strategy, the WCM Quality Global Growth Long Short Strategy, has averaged 23.5 percent uh, for the past six years. So their, their, their track record is outstanding. In terms of today's presentation, we're very lucky to have Ryan Quinn from WCM on the line. Ryan's going to be interviewed by our head of distribution, Al Dunn, who's based down in, in, in Melbourne in, in lockdown there. So it's fantastic to have him on the line today. Ryan's in Laguna Beach, California. Al's going to sort of talk to Ryan about the strategy, how WCM invest, and the process that they use at, at, at WCM. Thank you very much for, for all your time, all your support. Thank you for um, you know, the correspondence that we've been receiving and all the, and all the, you know, the, the positive uh, communication that's been coming back. Um, we look forward to talking more throughout the day, but without further ado, I'll now throw to Alistair, who will be interviewing Ryan. G'day, guys. Over to you. Thanks, Marty. And uh, I'd just like to take the opportunity to also extend my thanks to everyone on the call. Uh, it's greatly appreciated that you're taking the time out of your day to join us. And in, in particular, Ryan, thank you for taking the time as well. Um, Ryan, if, if I may, so the WCM are known for having quite a differentiated investment process. Are you able to take us through how that works in, in a portfolio stock selection process? Absolutely. And it's important to note that throughout all of our, our, our portfolios, we do utilize very similar processes. We just apply them to different marketplaces. So when anyone on, on the call who knows WCM uh, from our quality global growth vehicle can transport quite a few of those of those fundamental pieces of knowledge into what the long short vehicle is. Um, so for, for those uh, to take a step back, for those who may not be uh, as, as fun fundamentally aware of WCM, uh, we do start uh, a pretty simple process of investing, there, much of which is, is uh, similar to other managers. We, we invest in global growth businesses, uh, typically large and mega cap names, um, that have clean financials, uh, low or no debt, uh, strong free cash flow generation, uh, consistent earnings and revenue growth over time. Uh, and then we put them into portfo a concentrated portfolio with a long-term time horizon. So that's nothing that's very unique as compared to our, to our, uh, our peer set. Where we differentiate ourselves and where we've really been able to put ourselves ahead of the, of the, of the class uh, is really through our work and our view on economic moats. Uh, and secondly, our analysis uh, of the cultures inside the businesses that we buy. Mate, you've touched on two things there that, that I wouldn't mind unpacking just a little bit. The moat is kind of a well-held um, investment sort of thesis, I guess. Are you able to just explain what it is that you do differently at WCM around the moat and the work that you do on them? Yeah, certainly. I, I think Warren Buffett was the first one to make the, the concept of an economic moat popular. Uh, it, it's very tangible to a lot of investors, so it's, it's not surprising that it, that it, that it really stuck and, and, and resonated with folks. Um, you think about large businesses that have developed competitive advantage over time uh, through an extremely strong brand and, and, and success in the marketplace. Um, that's a business with a great moat. Um, however, what we've looked at over time, and, and, and WCM does quite a bit of learnings over, over history, uh, when we look into the market, we see that there have been quite a few businesses with very wide moats that have ended up with extremely poor performance. I mean, just think back historically over the last 15 or 20 years, if you owned Yahoo instead of Google, if you own Dell instead of Apple or, or uh, Nokia or Blackberry versus Apple, uh, you would have done very poorly. And those three simple decisions would, could have made you uh, a, a superstar, a, a huge amount of money, or you could have looked, looked you know, like a, poor, a pretty poor investor. All those business had, businesses at one point had an extremely wide economic moat. But, but what we realize is that it doesn't matter necessarily how wide or skinny or narrow uh, the economic moat is. We spend all of our time trying to decide and really illuminate the moat trajectory of a business. As long as the moat trajectory is positive, uh, meaning the business is taking share, means the, means, it means the business is growing, it means the business is getting better rather than worse in any given period, then that's a business that we want to own. We like 
trying to understand the moat trajectory of a business because it's not a line item in the financials. It's something that we over time have honed our skill at, a bit, at, at being able to uh, really identify. We've done it through learnings in, in time and learnings in history, uh, but you can also look at things like uh, high and rising return on invested capital uh, or things like, or, or things like uh, organic sales growth as, as really indicators of a positive moat trajectory. And we utilize that moat trajectory to help us make all of our decisions, whether it's buying, the, buying a name, trimming, uh, you know, adding to a name during, during uh, you know, different periods, trimming from an existing holding or selling it outright. And so the, the economic moat trajectory is, is really uh, the, the deciding factor that's going to drive uh, our, our portfolio management around a holding. And in this case, it also points to us putting a short position on. Uh, moving to the culture side of things, um, you know, WCM realized very early in our own success story that the culture internally here has been a significant factor in our success. So we sort of came to the epiphany that why not turn that lens onto our, onto our businesses? Why not take um, the culture of each enterprise that we're looking at and view it as the DNA as of that business? Really the defining factor of, of that, um, that, that will push employee behaviors and those, those behaviors either enable success or foster failure uh, over over time, good times and bad times. So that corporate culture is really uh, going to be uh, kind of a, 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 uh, a challenging factor to point to, but it's really the defining factor that's going to uh, be a sink or swim moment for businesses when they either are, have uh, tailwinds at their back or they have a headwind uh, in front of them. So the inaccurate um, assessment of a corporate culture is challenging to do. It's something that sets us apart from our peers because it takes quite a bit of time and repetition. And we've invested that time and repetition and personnel to focus on that factor for our, our investment holdings. Thanks, Ryan. Culture is clearly something, uh, particularly down here and probably across the globe, that's resonating more and more. And you know, there's not a day that goes by in the financial press that we're not seeing culture being touted on the, on the cover, either positive or negative, but the impact that can have on shareholder returns at a corporate level. Uh, and an investor level is, is quite pronounced. So thanks for taking the time to talk us through that. The, 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 your, your success as a manager on the long side of the portfolio is well documented and, and a number of people on the call in the market would, would have experienced that. Are you able to give us an understanding of the performance on the short side and how that plays into this strategy? Yeah, the performance on the short, let me take a step back. WCM as a, as a, as a manager, uh, by employing this moat trajectory piece and the culture piece, we unearth significant uh, data points in a business that we feel like others don't. And so over time, we've, we've done a great job harvesting gains and, and really winning on the long side uh, by, by focusing on these factors. But we've sort of left some performance off the table or left some, some profits off the table by really not making decisions around businesses we knew for sure were declining or deteriorating or, or going to be facing um, you know, a more, more losing environment than a winning environment. So what we did is we, we took those two key structures, the corporate culture and the economic mode, and, and decided to see what would happen if we, if we made bets against companies where we felt like we could very much point to a declining mode trajectory and a deteriorating corporate culture. We don't manage our long short fund in a, in a traditional hedge fund uh, way. Our shorts, uh, we, run, we run a directionally long portfolio. So it still feels like to us the same way we run our long, our long portfolio. And then we make diversified shorts on the other side that are specifically tied to declining mode trajectories and weak co corporate cultures. And that ability to make money on the short side allows us to gain more conviction and have more capital to lay out on the long side. So the goal of the short book is not to beat the market. The goal of the short book is to really enable the uh, performance of the high conviction long ideas. They're not hedges. Um, they're not, uh, you know, uh, it's not going to be that we, we buy Wizz Air and we short Ryanair. It's not, it's not a paired trade. It's not a, it's not a market neutral strategy. Uh, these are alpha generated investments that are risk managed to a point that allow us to have more and higher conviction on the long book. I think since inception, the short book is down uh, for, uh, about 8%. Um, over that time, the, the MSCI Acqui Index was up 50%. So you can imagine if by only losing 8% in a market that is up 50%, uh, our shorts have done a, a nice job of protecting capital as that market tide has risen. Um, one of the reasons we don't need to have outsized short bets like many other hedge funds do are the characteristics of our long book. 
historically WCM longs lose less money in negative markets and capture more of the upside in positive markets. That's a defining factor. It makes, it makes our long only portfolio much less risky than it would sound. Uh, and so we don't have to take a significant amount of risk on the short side to generate that performance. In fact, our, our, our performance over uh, the long term has been significantly higher than the index. And it's really attributed by the longs losing less money in negative markets the shorts not losing uh, as much money as the market in the general upswing and our upside capture of, of our long portfolio over that period as well. Thanks, Ryan. If, if we're talking about a, a directionally long portfolio, are you able to just talk us through what that looks like from a characteristics point of view? Number of longs, number of shorts, potentially the net and gross exposure on average for the portfolio? Absolutely. So the long book will have in general around 110 to 125% of total gross exposure. That'll be in 30 to 50 holdings. Um, think about of a, of a 2% to 5% position size. It's very typical uh, portfolio management style for our long portfolio for our quality global growth vehicle. Uh, on the short side, we're targeting around 30 to 40% total gross short. Okay, that'll be again in 30 to 50 holdings. Uh, same number of holdings, but significantly less exposure means that our, our, our typical holding, uh, our typical position size is gonna be around a half of a percent to maybe up to 3%, but that would be a very large short for us. So, so really a, a much tighter range as to where, where the short positions will be. And that gets us to a portfolio of, of a total gross exposure range around 140 to 160% on a gross basis. And then on the net basis, as we mentioned, directionally long, uh, we're gonna be about 80% to 90% net long at any given time. Excellent. And, and how does that get expressed, expressed at a sector level or, or an industry level within the portfolio, looking at the long side in, in the first instance? Yeah, so, you know, we're going to be investing, uh, whether it's long or short, in areas that have long term global tailwinds, right? So they're winners and losers when tailwinds happen. And so we're, we want to be with the winners on the long book w w around global tailwinds. And then we want to be short some of the names that, that are getting disintermediated or that are just not keeping up with that, that type of a, 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 a progress. Um, when it comes to, uh, uh, you know, sector wise, uh, what, it, what we won't be having is we're not going to be long growth and, and short, uh, short value, right? So we're not, we're not, trying to be long factors and short factors. We really want to, to hang our hat on and, 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 and hitch our, our wagon to alpha driven investments, whether they're long or short. Now we are growth investors. So you can, you can expect us to be uh, in, the, in the sectors that we typically play in because we're not gonna start doing work on energy companies when we don't own any of them just to find some shorts. That's, just, that's, not, a, that's not a holistically balanced portfolio. Um, we tend to avoid those, those classic value sectors. And so we won't have those value sectors in, in the short book. We're really truly going to be finding businesses in healthcare, technology, uh, materials, um, you know, some of the industrial names that, that, that are going to be the, the, the real generators of, of, uh, of ideas for us. And so there isn't a great overweight, underweight discussion when it comes to a long short strategy versus an index. But I will, I can say that our largest exposures on, on, in, in the portfolio will continue to be very consistent with the rest of our, our, our portfolios in terms of being in technology, healthcare, healthcare, industrials, et cetera. And we will then always be significantly underweight, if not, not exposed at all to areas like real estate, utilities, and, and energy. Okay. That's great, mate. Thank you. And perhaps now we might just have a look at some of the stocks in the portfolio, but maybe a name on the long side, just to give, give a bit of an understanding of how that comes to life from a process point of view. Sure. So, so at, around uh, WCM, we like to talk about picks and shovels businesses. Um, it's a reference to the, to the gold rush that happened in America and, and where the miners uh, made very, very much less money than, than the businesses that sold those miners their picks and shovels. And so uh, from a technology perspective, one of our favorite holdings that we own in the long book, which we own in multiple different portfolios, whether it's our global vehicle, uh, the emerging markets portfolio, et cetera, um, is Taiwan Semiconductor. It's also a major holding in, in, the, in the long short strategy. It's a picks and shovels uh, business within the chip making industry. Um, so their, their moat grows and is, re remains positive as long as the complexity of advanced chip making uh, it, it, it persists within the industry. Um, 
Taiwan Semiconductor is the only independent foundry that is creating these microchips that are going into everything from your coffee maker to your watch, uh, to your, the, the technology in your car, uh, or, or frankly, in, into any high-speed computing that, that is necessary across governments, militaries, et cetera. And so Taiwan Semi has uh, a really full pipeline uh, of, of demand for its processes. Now, what we love about being in, involved in that space is that there is a race to create the, the next best chip the next you know, the next highest performing processor we don't have to pick the, the the winning horse we're with the foundry that's going to be creating all the chips so they're they're sitting dead in the middle of the value proposition in a long term tailwind that we think we can count on over time in fact we've owned this name for over 15 years in, in our focus growth international portfolio the complexity of, of microchips these days, uh, we, we're seeing get down to a significantly small, infinitesimally small level um, that only a company like Taiwan Semiconductor can do. And what we, what we like to say, they, they climb the value chain. They're an outsourced research and development partner to Apple, AMD, Intel, any business that wants to create these chips because they can't backfill all the R&D, the 20 years of investment that, that, that Taiwan Semiconductor has already put in the ground to create these chips. So their value proposition is massive because the, the businesses that want to create the chips can't create the foundry to do it. Um, so, so that's a, a business that has a significantly uh, you know, positive moat trajectory, a long runway of opportunity in front of it, and a very classic picks and shovels business that we like to own. Great. Well, as, as Marty said, I'm in, in Victoria on lockdown with three children homeschooling. The amount of technology floating around this house with uh, Taiwan semiconductor chips in it, I'm probably expecting a Christmas card from them. Is, <laughs> are, you, are you able to provide a, then an understanding, of potentially a company name or an example on the short side of the portfolio, just to bring that to life a little bit? Sure. I, you know, I appreciate you, you, you being sensitive to that. And obviously, you know, it's not a great reputation to be a, a short seller of businesses and you know we, we are long-term partners to, to our the companies we invest with and so um, uh, what I will be able to share is there's there's a business that we've been short on and off over time um, called Ambev. Uh, it, it, it actually was a long holding in our emerging markets portfolio as well as our focus growth international portfolio for some time and the long thesis was that it's a you know it's a very large uh, Brazilian beer company uh, that had 80% uh, market share in places like Argentina and Brazil, uh, which was the significant portion of their volumes. And they were the dominant uh, provider of, of beer uh, to the Latin American region. Um, the goal of the business, uh, as seen by you know uh, Anheuser Busch taking over control in 2016, was to premium uh, to 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 provide premiumization of of beer consumption within Latin America, and so they felt like they would be able to, uh, with their scale, roll out premium beers that would be purchased by by the consumer in Latin America. Uh, what we what we saw uh, and what actually led us to selling the business uh, out, of, out of our long book was that they were they were struggling to uh, affect that premium premiumization uh, playbook. Uh, their volumes began to fall. And then we also noticed that there is significant uh, correlation to the economic environment within Latin America. At the time, Brazil was going through a crushing uh, foreign exchange uh, decline. Uh, their government was in uh, disarray and, and they were facing uh, crippling inflation. And that led to a, a significant decline in, in, in beer sales. Uh, and that's a little unique because on the other hand, in, in, in areas like the US and Europe, um, that tends to lead to greater beer sales. Um, and, and, and for some reason in Latin America, they, they turned away from 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 uh, from the beers at the, at that time, so in seeing that we exited the name, and now what we did then when we turned and, and continued our work on on the business because we never completely turn our, our back on the business, uh, we noticed that that there were a couple of different competitors that were bringing premium premium beers to market and actually taking market share, and we watched uh, Ambev's market share fall from the mid 80s down to 60 percent. And, and there was being, and the, and the share winners, the, those that were having a positive moat trajectory were Heineken and Petropolis Group. And so we continued to see them winning in this premium, premiumization trade and Ambev uh, where their prior, their scale and their reach and, and, and their, uh, their size really afforded advantages of distribution and economies of scale. 
that failed to, to come true anymore. And, and the, the competitors were, are slowly eating away at, at, their, at their competitive advantage. Um, so we've been kind of in and out of, of the name based on the health of, of, of the Brazilian economy and based on uh, you know, what's, what's been going on for, on the investor base over time. And, and really the declining moat trajectory uh, is, is the reason that we, could, we won't own the name again. And likely while we will continue to be a, a tourist on the short side uh, for the business. Thanks, mate. That's a, it's a really interesting way of thinking about it, that, you know, that moat being a live um, entity, I guess, and as it expands, it's a long position, potentially as it contracts, it can, it can quite quickly become a short idea. Look, um, we, might, we might leave it there. There, there are no more questions. Um, you know, Ryan, uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your support. And, you know, have a fantastic day.